Welcome to Sputnik, orbiting the world with me, George Galloway. And me, Gayatri. Not many rich men put serious money into politics in Britain, and why should they? This is a country where the expenditure of mere thousands can secure a K, a knighthood, and a single million can buy you a P, a peerage, a seat in Parliament, and for life. Aaron Banks is unique. Not only has he put many millions of pounds into British politics, he put it into people parties and causes, which the political class and its media echo chambers agreed were cranks, eccentrics, and above all, had no chance of winning. The rest is history, of course. Farage, UKIP and Brexit have changed the course of that history, <clears throat> and none of it could have happened without Aaron Banks. And not just his money, either. As others have been slow to grasp, Banks is his own man with his own ideas and his own ambitions. He's even up close and personal with Donald Trump. In a few days' times, the President of the United States of America. So who is Aaron Banks and what does he want? <laughs> we better find out. Aaron, welcome to the Sputnik. How up close George, and personal? George, hi, how are you? <laughs> <laughs> who would well, have thought it? I, I, I don't like the word up close and personal. Well, I was going to ask, how <laughs> up close a bit too, uh, and personal? Well, you know, we've, we've been close to him, but certainly not up close and too personal. No. But, uh, what, what, I mean, what's it like? You, you've met him. Most yeah. of the people who hate him uh, have never uh, met mm. him. Uh, Piers Morgan, who knows him well, mm. thinks he's a, a fine fellow. Was that your impression? Well, we've met him on several occasions when Nigel went down to Mississippi and uh, spoke for him, and then, obviously, we went to Trump Towers and uh, spent an hour with him. Strangely, like a lot of people, off camera and in private, he was actually a very different personality, much quieter, reflective, um, and I, I was actually quite impressed with him. Mm. I mean, clearly, um, he's pretty bombastic, but mm. in private, not that wasn't our impression at all. And what about the public impression that he gives of him being very close with his family, very close business ties? Yeah, family, that, yeah. Did we, you meet them? We've met a number of the family, um, because the interesting thing was going down to Mississippi and doing that event, and then there, there were all the debates as well. So over time, we got to know all of the Trump team, and it was really interesting that if you've seen his uh, children interviewed, they're very educated, very calm, very impressive people. So I think, I think like a lot of people, a lot of successful mm. businessmen, he is quite um, mercurial. Um, so I think he can, you know, explode. Yeah, <laughs> but uh, that can be dangerous, um, of course, when you're the most powerful well, man yes. in the world. Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, uh, people have legitimate uh, yeah. anxieties uh, about that. Yeah. Having said that, he's come under now such relentless pressure yeah. from this really rather powerful coalition of people, the intelligence so-called community, as we call them nowadays. <laughs> we used to call them spy agencies in, uh, in earlier times. I'm not sure much intelligence is going into not the community. Exactly. Intelligence <laughs> is the one thing they often seem to yeah. lack. Uh, but it is a coalition mm. of uh, the military-industrial complex, about which yeah. General Eisenhower warned yeah. us, the intelligence services, mm. and uh, a war party inside the Republican Party, John McCain and people mm. like that, and then the entire liberal class. Mm. Uh, that's a very, very powerful array of enemies, yet mm. he seems to stand up to them. I mean, only in the press conference mm. this week, he didn't uh, give any quarter. No. But I think he's using the press. I mean, I think he's learned how to turn those, those people and their techniques against them. And I think you saw in that press conference, what he was basically saying was, we don't, I don't need you. Yeah. So, you know, if you're going to <laughs> be objectionable, I mean, we, we were talking beforehand that CNN, you know, uh, otherwise known in America as the Clinton News Network, mm. um, has run some pretty horrendous stuff. And I think he's learned how to go above them, but use them at the same time. Mm. You know, the failing New York Times. Um, New York Times has got 30 million Twitter followers. So even when you're in an argument with the New York Times, you're, you're getting your you're message directly to the, yes. to the people. Yes, no doubt. Um, um, now, the latest uh, tranche of allegations, <laughs> insinuations, <laughs> innuendo, is uh, of a, a pretty unpleasant nature mm. relating to personal conduct in a hotel in Moscow and so on. Mm. That attack was launched and then began to fall apart within mm. hours. Uh, names were spelt wrongly, mm. dates were used that couldn't possibly apply. Uh, it really was mm. fake news. But one of the things that most interested me was that it seems to have emanated mm. from British sources. 
Uh, yeah. uh, it's alleged that a former British uh, intelligence man, he, despite a D notice, he's been named in some uh, uh, social media circles, uh, and a former British ambassador to Moscow uh, is the man who mm. reportedly gave it to John McCain, mm. who then gave it to the mm. uh, FBI. This is very <clears throat> embarrassing for the British government, isn't it? Well, I think there's a lot of angst, because uh, if you look at, uh, you know, the, the British government's kind of... Uh, what they said about or oh, British government Theresa May's aides, I think one of them called called Trump the chump. Yes. Um, there were other unflattering comments. I think even Boris said that he wouldn't go to New York City in case, case he, he bumped, bumped into, into Trump. Yeah, exactly. you know, so they haven't got off to a, a cracking start. And I suppose to hear that British intelligence leaked this story um, with another Russian angle is probably going down like a sick bag in Washington or with the Trump people right now. I would have thought so. All the more reason why they might well have utilized the good offices of your mate, Nigel Farage. I mean, yes. uh, Trump famously said that, uh, that he'd exactly. make a good British uh, ambassador. Well, what look, do you think of that? I think, uh, I think Trump is redefining how to communicate. Um, I don't think the British probably took kindly to being told to point, you know, Nigel as the, the British on ambassador. Twitter. On Twitter. <laughs> it's, even, it's even more of a slap round the face, isn't it, really? Yeah. But the bottom line is, it depends what they want. I mean, Nigel's got probably the best relationship, not just with Trump, by the way, but with many of the Senate, who he's... Uh, a lot of the people on certain side of the Republican Party see Nigel as a, as a rock star liberation hero almost and, and so in America his profile is very very high hmm. um, and frankly as well politically you know what better way to get rid of Farage to make him British ambassador and well, to, that's right, uh, get actually, him with, I, I yeah. never thought about it they, they could have buttoned him up in a penguin suit have, yes. for the next four years <laughs> well but, but also I think you know the political scene is shifting here and uh, you know we've continued our polling from the referendum the, the operation we've got we found some very interesting things that the Conservatives may think they're in a very strong position right now we have seen the Liberal Democrats start to to rise up in some of the you know the Tory seats and I think the Labour the Party is under severe threat from UKIP if it ever got its act together. So I think to package Nigel off to Washington uh, would have been a very smart thing to do. The problem is yeah. an ambassador is someone who is sent to lie abroad for their country. <laughs> and uh, Theresa uh, tre 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 <laughs> May uh, couldn't have counted on, <laughs> on Farage to, uh, to tell her lies. Yeah. Uh, he might have told his own, but he certainly <laughs> wouldn't have uh, been guaranteed to tell her. I think, uh, by the way, the, Ameri the, the, the new administration would love to do a trade deal with the British as quickly out of the blocks as they could. And I think, uh, despite the shakiness of the relationship, I think Nigel's been pushing that very hard. And I think, you know, that could actually start to undermine the EU in terms of the leverage they think they've got with, with, with all mm. of this. So, we so no hard feelings to, then? On what? From, from uh, Trump towards Britain? Um, I think Trump is, is, is going to be the, the president that's got the warmest feelings to, to the, the UK. Um, that, that we've ever had. I mean, his mother's Scottish um, and apparently is a massive fan of the Queen, so that might not please you, but, um, but I underst you know, understand that she's... Uh, she's yeah, I, I, right and his name is Donald. I, I did <laughs> think uh, this week uh, the song, Andy Stewart's famous song, Donald Was Your Trouser, uh, did uh, flip through my mind uh, this week. It's a, uh, but it's a huge experiment, George, because he, what we're seeing with the people he's appointing, mm. uh, he's, appoint he's a businessman, and he's appointed some very, very clever billionaires um, into his administration that will ring, run circles around the usual political non-entities. And probably won't well, uh, so. fiddle their expenses because well, they're, they're already vastly rich. You'd like yeah, to think that's, so. That's what you hope, yeah. <laughs> However, uh, you can never guarantee us. Yeah, yeah, just keep but going here's through. a paradox. Mm. You've had all this success. Yep. Uh, you, I mean, it's hard to s s really, I know this mm. sounds like overstating it, but since Churchill, uh, I'm not sure that anyone mm. other than your small group have changed Britain, no, no. Uh, changed Britain's future in such a way mm. since Churchill in 1941. Uh, and yet you haven't made the breakthrough. You, you put enough money mm. into the Brexit campaign to have purchased mm. seven or eight seats in the House of Lords. Whole family. But you, 
<laughs> your, your whole family, your Brother whole group knows. <laughs> could have all been in the <laughs> House yeah. of Lords. Yeah. I'd um, abolish it, by the yeah. way, personally. So I'd, yeah, yeah, yeah uh, well, you and me personal, both. Uh, uh, but yeah. but they, they won't even put Farage in, in there. Is he is he going to give up on on British politics? I think there's a pettiness involved around that because, you know, I would have thought there's very few things that you and Nigel agree on politically, probably other than. You know, the fact yeah, that you the elect politicians to do your bidding and then you should be able to sack them and, yeah. and replace them. Yeah. So, you know, uh, we agreed on that, that we wouldn't want to see, you know, the sort of government you would want, but mm. we agree that that was fundamentally what should happen. Mm. Um, but I do think that in rejecting Nigel the way they've done, they probably have sown the seeds of, <laughs> yeah, exactly. you know, a possible revival of it. And I, mm. I do think that politically, though, you, you say, well, we haven't achieved uh, maybe parliamentary success, but it's very hard to break through in that with the first past the post system. But I see signs that, uh, you know, Brexit has well, caused tremors. Well, I've done tremors. it twice, and, yeah. uh, and well, you, then, of course, you are one of the not. people that have actually done that. Yeah, yeah uh, and I, I can show you my scars. It's, uh, <laughs> it's a very, very uh, difficult thing to do. I'm, I'm just wondering if, if he's going to try again, in your view. I don't, Should he try I again? think it would depend, I think, on the circumstances and what's brewing up, because I, I suppose the, the tragedy of the Labour Party is that Corbyn and McConnell are, without any shadow of a doubt, leave people mm. but yet because of the situation in the party and the like they ended up on the wrong side of the yeah. historic argument and that that must be a big disappointment because really the Labour Party should have been full square behind leave yeah. and reaping the electoral benefit Indeed, that it could have, uh, it when could the have history happened, comes you know. to be written I think that will be uh, as clear as day and yeah. even Corbyn's attempt to relaunch the Labour yeah. Party's <laughs> position this week vis-a-vis yeah. uh, -vis, uh, Brexit and free movement of Labour so-called uh, well it, let's say it didn't take off uh, in the way that one no. would have uh, hoped no. we'll talk about in the second half the uh, the way forward in uh, British politics but I'd also like to talk to you about what you think is going to happen to mm. the EU uh, mm. across the European Union mm. but uh, stay tuned we'll be right back welcome back to Sputnik Aaron Banks is one of the most successful people in the entire history of British politics and yet the chances are you've never seen him interviewed but we're remedying that here, Aaron, thanks for uh, staying with us. Uh, Brexit was the first breach in the wall, but there are many more uh, on the way. Uh, in Italy, uh, you've got the uh, defeat of the uh, pr Prime Minister in the referendum. You've got the Five Star Movement uh, looking like it may come to power. In France, either a very Eurosceptic President yes. Fillon will be elected, or an ultra uh, <laughs> skeptic, indeed hostile, Europhobe uh, Marine Le Pen mm. uh, will, will be the next uh, president. In Germany, Merkel is under pressure. In the Netherlands, the government's under pressure. People are talking openly about the euro uh, being abandoned and so on. Do you think it's possible that, that in five years, maybe ten years' mm. time, there won't be a European Union like well, the one that we've left. Yeah. I mean, my bu uh, business partner um, with, the, with the bank we're involved in uh, firmly believe that the euro will cease to exist within the next three to five years. That doesn't mean that something uh, akin to a kind of a smaller kind of Benelux version of it will mm. carry on. Mm. But it's clear to all to see that if these countries don't exit the euro, they are just going down the road of destruction. Mm. I, I find, find it very interesting, the whole, what you just laid out there, because if you look at the European Union, we kind of compare it to like the Titanic that's hit the iceberg, and the, the people at the top are still drinking their martinis while the, yeah. <laughs> the yeah. basement's yeah. filling up with water, yeah. and the thing's going to sink, but they're still in a total denial. The violins are still... The violins <laughs> are playing, the by, 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 by me is <laughs> kicking off. But, but the, the interesting thing is that the European Union itself seems impervious to the signs. I mean, if you, I mean, I, I compare. You see, look at Marie Le Pen. I really don't like the politics of, um, you know, the Front National, which is almost a kind of almost a Vichy mm -hmm. remainder of almost a fascist party. Is, yeah. Now, Nigel's the sort of guy that you take to tea with your grandma. Mm -hmm. um, Marie Le Pen are, you know, the, the, these are 
people whose political views are, are really sort of, you know, pretty extreme. And yeah. Gert Wilders, you know, probably might even mm. trump her. Mm. So and in Italy, as you know, it's more coming from the left. Um, yeah. So there's a whole cocktail of things going on here. But for the EU to remain unbending in this scale um, just merely says to me that it has to end. But, but the, the factors that cause it to end, of course, are, you know, completely unknown. Well, the, the Titanic is a very good metaphor. Yeah. Another would be the last days of Pompeii. Yes. Uh, <laughs> this empire. That's, true. That's uh, even better uh, one, actually. Yes. Got, well, uh, I, I know you're like of the European classics. bureaucrat sort of frozen in. <laughs> <laughs> I know you're a man for the classics and the, oh, to get and that the, the Roman uh, <laughs> Empire. Learn, learn with Aaron. Yeah. I've always uh, followed that. <laughs> um, Hashtag learn with Aaron. Yeah, maybe, maybe we should do a double act on that. Um, but the. That, the the uh, Italian example that you mentioned is of great interest to me because we've spoken before on radio and uh, you did have this view of a five-star movement yeah. Uh, yeah. in Britain. Yeah. I think that would do mm. very well. I, I myself would be happy to mm. participate in that if it was a broadly based coalition yeah. like our campaign for Brexit, mm. which had communists well. and both Leftist. communist party, the, 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 yes. the old. Yes, yeah. the new communists and the old uh, <laughs> communists and me. Uh, so, you, you you know, that kind of a movement yeah. just didn't necessarily stand in elections, no. though it, it could, might, mm. uh, but which uh, exists as a pressure mm. uh, on the political class. In Italy, that has worked yeah. really but, quite effectively. But, but it's interesting as well because, uh, you know, the, the whole UKIP journey the, the way the left tried to demonise UKIP for all the views they held, which in a lot of cases were not unreasonable views. I mean, immigration was affecting working class mm. yeah. voters more than anybody else. But it was Especially demonized. black and Asian British mm -hmm. workers. Yeah, and it, they uh, were the first victims. In fact, I would love to see an analysis of it, but I would say that the, the immigrant community probably, you know, the existing one may well have voted out as a uh, collection uh, uh, of people. I'm certain of that. Yeah. Um, and despite the, my yeah. campaign was. Yeah quite often yeah. uh, concentrated yeah. on that. That demonisation, even to the point where, if you look at the, the breakdown of the UKIP um, parliamentary candidates, they fielded more ethnic minority candidates mm. than any other party. But as in all things, you do have an element of it that is, um, you know, it's like the Labour Party sure. that's wholly unacceptable, yes. you know. And well, so that's what happens when you've got a, a party. A party. A yes. Now, that is true. That's true. And that's why I'm appealed to it. It appeals to me because I think you could put this coalition together. Yeah. But the thing I've learned... It's easier for people to engage. Engage you know, and the social media skills we've learned and the whole you know, way you can actually do it. And you see, Trump, Trump Farage is really interesting because it's not really about Trump. He is the, the mouthpiece, mm. if you like, for mm. a movement. Mm. Yeah. And I think a lot of the Bernie Sanders supporters went and supported Trump yeah. because they wanted change. They wanted to break the establishment and they saw Trump as a, an instrument from which to smash it. Yeah. And I think it's true here. I mean, we look at, we, you know, we sat one ambassador, Sir Ivan, replacing him with Sir Tim. Shuffle you know, the night, you yeah. shuffle the knights around the, <laughs> around the table yeah. and actually nothing ever changes. Yeah. And so, you know, we were debating earlier before, weren't we, saying that, uh, that actually I would nationalise industries. I would have government focused on doing a very narrow, limited number of things, which is almost quite libertarian. But what they do, they do really well, like the health service, education. You focus on what you can do well, rather than trying to be, ever, you know, trying to get involved in everybody's life. Well, neither of us would have as yeah. elegant a suit uh, if it had been made by a state-run tailor, <laughs> and nor would we have lunched so well uh, if we'd lunched in a state restaurant. But there are some True. things yeah, I mean, that are natural yeah. monopolies yeah. that the state should run, shouldn't it? I completely agree with that because if you take the state, if you take power companies and infrastructure, these are merely uh, monopolies uh, handed over to private industry exactly. to uh, extract money, and they're they're just as inefficient as their state, uh, you know, and, uh, and getting well. much more uh, uh, subsidy and getting huge mm -hmm. amounts of subsidy. And actually, really, it's it's been a blind alley from which we've gone down. But that's the political problem of left and right. Mm. Um, and I think what we've got to aspire to be as radical, you, you actually pick the ideas that work from both yeah. sides of the equation. Well, uh, left and right is definitely being yeah. redrawn. As you speak, I realise that mm. uh, although nobody would have guessed it before watching this interview, we actually have a lot of common ground. Yeah. Let me test you on one. 
I, I, I believe that banks mm. are the same as uh, utility companies. Mm -hmm. Bank, banking is just a utility. Well, for, for, I think we probably would agree with this that the financial crisis was caused by exuberance of banks getting outside what they should be doing, which is lending to consumers and lending to business for real enterprise rather than gambling and, and, and doing stuff that is outside their remit. Mm -hmm. So I would actually have a state-run bank and the other banks uh, are being given a huge advantage with the funding they're getting from the Bank of England and, and other things, mm -hmm. you know, to actually not do banking, but to, to, you know, basically manipulate whatever they're doing. So if it's a utility, and I would regard core banking as a utility business, yes, it should be in state hands and it should be tightly controlled so that the crisis we had never happens again. Mm -hmm. And if Goldman Sachs can go and get a load of investors that want to, you know, have a go. Sure. Fine. Let them do but, that, But yeah. they should never right, be in a position where deposit yeah. our money yeah. that we deposit. I mean, who does, who does it hurt when there's a banking crisis? Yeah. Not people like me. Yeah. I mean, I do well out of it because, you know, the, the volatility, shares crash, you buy it back cheap. It's, it's normal people that see their, you know, their savings under pressure and all the rest of it. I mean, the government's reduced interest rates to 0%. It's prudent, modest people that have had their life savings basically obliterated. Uh, it's not that just is, you know, uh, to me that's that just they're using you know, our money, yeah. Aaron. Uh, we are guaranteeing their... And underwriting their business, uh, yeah. Because if they fail... Well, underwriting uh, their failure, as it yes, happens. Yes, we, yeah. we can't allow them to fail, so... So I would wholeheartedly agree with that, that you, a bank is either a normal institution that just does banking, um, and I, I wouldn't be averse to you know, seeing that in public ownership. Well, you, as a, a further example, Donald Trump this week mm. denounced Big Pharma. And Absolutely. It's a yeah. super profiteering yep. on its uh, effective monopoly of uh, producing the medicines that people need to Correct. live. And yet people say he's on the right. Mm. Uh, Hillary Clinton would never have challenged Big Pharma. They were probably filling our yeah. uh, coffers uh, with the profits. Well, I think uh, Mr. Trump's only problem is that a bit like the number of people wanting to get rid of JFK were lined up around the corner. They couldn't mm. work out who it was. Um, as you said, I think, at the beginning, there's a whole industrial complex around mm. um, corruption and, and the I, like I, in the I, States. I, I, if yeah. you see yeah. him, tell him this from, uh, from me. Yeah. He should avoid grassy knolls. <laughs> he should never drive I think he knows that, George. Car, <laughs> no, open open no. <laughs> because uh, I have never seen a more virulent, yeah. mm. uh, and I've been in politics mm. well over 40 years now, uh, I have never seen a more virulent collection mm. of people. And the Liberals are the most virulent yeah. of all. All these nice Liberals yeah. are almost literally foaming mm. at the mouth. Well, I think they've, they just can't believe what's happened. But you make a good point with the farmer because actually as a big business person, they know where to go looking to, to uh, attack the problem mm. and some of the people he's hired in are clever businessmen so we will see it's an experiment I grant you that we're gonna see you know where where this all takes us but to, as a first stab to say well you know actually we're gonna take on the pharmaceutical companies that's pretty pretty bold yeah, stuff very much so it's yeah. gonna be a roller coaster it's gonna be great and, uh... <laughs> It's, not, it's going to be huge. It's never going to be boring. <laughs> and you know what? I think he's going to build the wall. It's going to be big. It's going to be beautiful. And the Mexicans are going to pay for it. <laughs> <laughs> you must come back and review that uh, uh, at a later date. Alan Banks, it's been a real pleasure. Pleasure as well. Thanks, Thanks very much yeah. for joining us. Yeah. And now it's your turn to tell us what you think through the portals of social media. What's rattling, Gayatri? So we discussed with Aaron the Five Star Movement in Italy and the prospects of it here in Britain. Mm. And Master of Reality replies, uh, yes, Britain needs it as well. The status quo is not representative of the electorate who reject the liberal elite PC politics. Yeah, I'm quite excited about it, actually. I think I volunteered myself <laughs> for it today and uh, I, I intend to play a role in that. It would be very interesting. And this hysteria uh, about uh, Russia inter intervening, is it all based on fact or fiction? Simon Goodall says, fiction. Politics of fear is to justify arms sales and NATO policy of poking the Russian bear to create a self-fulfilling prophecy. And Salman Khan says, 
They claim Corbyn would take us back to 1980s politics, but the current establishment is taking us to 1950s Cold War politics. I couldn't put those ideas better myself. That's absolutely correct. We'll see if the British Cold War attitude survives a Donald Trump presidency <laughs> and much else. <laughs> exactly. Well, that's all the tweets we have time for today. Which, alas, means that's the end of the show. Stay in touch with us, though, on social media, Twitter, RT underscore Sputnik or Facebook. Sputnik on Russia Today. It's goodbye from me, Gayatri. And from me, George Galloway. It's been marvellous.